G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In this video we're going to talk about automatic transmission fluids. Specifically, we'll take a look at an automatic transmission and the major components. We will talk about the functions of an automatic transmission fluid. And then, a bit of disclosure here, I'm not all that familiar with um, the formulation side of an automatic transmission fluid. However, from the function, we will be able to determine the formulation requirements and that will give us a, a pretty good window into what are the kinds of base oil selection decisions and additive decisions that you would have to make if you were formulating one. All right, so first of all, let's uh, take a, a picture of a car. As you would all be very well aware, power is developed by an engine. Now, increasingly, we're starting to see EVs, but for the most part, it's an internal combustion engine. And really, most of the componentry in the car is in service of getting the power that is developed by the engine somehow to the wheels. So if you have a rear wheel drive car, you've got to translate the power that comes from the front, or really, really power or torque, um, into the wheels. So obviously you've got to connect the wheels to the engine in some way and generally it's through a differential but the speed of the engine is not usually matched to the speed of the wheels so you've got to have some kind of mechanism some gearing mechanism which can help you reduce the speed of the engine so it matches the speed of the wheels now in some circumstances let's say for example a, a manual gearbox. When you hit the brakes, you need to, at the same time, engage the clutch, right? To disengage the gears, because at that point, there will be a big discrepancy between the engine speed and the wheel speed. In an automatic transmission, there is obviously no cl clutch. So um, if, you, if you stop the wheels, um, then it's the actual gearbox itself that is going to have to make the decision to disengage from engine power. So the way it achieves that is the modern automatic gearbox. And if you just look at that thing, it is a wonder of modern engineering. Um, the fact that these can operate reliably for two to 300,000 kilometers is just incredible, a real uh, a feat of human engineering. But let's go through the major components. So first up, you've got the torque converter. Uh, the torque converter is, it's a fluid coupling, okay? So it has kind of two halves to it, half of which is connected to the engine and half of which is connected to the gearbox. And they translate torque between them by means of a fluid, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about how it does that. All right, second component is the mechatronic. The mechatronic is, if you like, the brains of the gearbox. So there is an actual uh, computer inside it, which will make decisions over, um, you know, basically gear timing, um, as in when to change gears and what gear it will be in. Um, it also is able to translate those commands by means of hydraulic actuators, right? So there are solenoid valves which um, cause hydraulic actuators to move. That sends hydraulic power to different parts of the gearbox. And what that enables us to do is to change gears. Now, as you can see, the gear set in here, and this is a cutaway, is quite complex. Um, you can't really see it very well from this picture. Um, but there's two different components, right? There's the actual gears themselves, and then there are the clutch packs which engage the gears. Um, these, the automatic transmissions are based on the planetary gear set. So again, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail later in this video. All right, so let's start with the torque converter and how it works. So with a torque converter, we have on the inside, right? Um, let's start with the the bit that's connected to the to the engine speed. So there is a shaft that runs through it and connected to that shaft, we have effectively a centrifugal pump, 
right? So it's just, it's obviously shaped as a circle. And when you spin it, right, it is going to generate a rotational motion of the fluid that's contained inside the torque converter. So you've actually got automatic transmission fluid in it, and as it spins, it's gonna induce a rotation in the fluid. Now on the other side of this um, spinning pump, we also have a turbine, right? Which is kind of the same size on the opposite side. And as you induce rotation in the fluid from the pump, that rotation is gonna hit the turbine and cause it to spin as well. And that's how the rotation of the pump, which you'll remember is connected to the engine, is translated into rotation of the turbine, which is connected to the gearbox. And that's the way that we translate engine rotation into gearbox rotation. Now there's gonna be a little bit of a lag here, right? Because we need a little bit of time to, to, to translate the power that comes from the pump into the turbine. So there's going to be a little bit of a lag there. All right, so now that we've got an idea for how the torque converter works, right, we can get an idea for what are the requirements of an automatic transmission fluid in this particular application. And here, the automatic transmission fluid is acting like a hydraulic oil or a circulating oil. So one thing that we do need, because we're translating power between, between the two sides, is we need something with very high hydraulic efficiency. And effectively, in a hydraulic oil, that means something with a very high viscosity index, right? That's gonna help us with hydraulic efficiency. It's gonna mean that m most of the power that is developed by the engine is gonna get translated um, onto the gearbox. Now, in practice, these torque converters are about 90% efficient. So when they're up at full speed, 90% of the power is translated into the, um, uh, into the uh, turbine side. However, in most modern um, automatic transmissions, once it gets up to speed, uh, the two will actually be physically connected by a clutch mechanism. And so at that point, it becomes almost 100% efficient. The last thing that you need is also low traction. So we've spoken about traction before, and that is kind of the internal friction of the, of the fluid. And so by having a low traction coefficient in your hydraulic, well, in sorry, in your ATF, um, it will, again, reduce the amount of energy loss that occurs within the torque converter. All right, so there are three of the major requirements for this part of the gearbox. All right, so now let's look at the mechatronic. Totally different kettle of fish. The mechatronic relies on solenoid valves, um, you know, uh, causing actuators to move. So these are these are really tight tolerant servo valves. And if you were to take a look at the diagram, in particular the, the actual spool, you can see that there are, first of all, these things are very small, but second of all, there's a decent amount of hydraulic power that goes through them and the tolerances on these are very, very tight because we've obviously got seal mechanisms um, which seal off the different parts of the valve. So what we need in this instance is we need something that, first of all, has high hydraulic efficiency, right? So that any actuation of the valve uh, translates very quickly into hydraulic power we need something with very low deposit formation. So if we form deposits around something like one of these valves, it can lead to valve sticking, right? Which means that potentially one of these valves could get stuck in either the open or closed position. So we need low deposit formation. Um, and what we also need is keep clean performance out of the ATF. So if there are any deposits that form because of let's say oxidation, that we're able to clean those up very, very easily. Um, there's probably one other one that I didn't put on this list, which would be oxidative stability. And that's really related to low deposit formation. All right, well, the final part, and in some ways, you could argue the most important part of the gearbox, is the actual gears themselves. Now, the actual gears are generally, 
well, in every automatic transmission I've ever come across, a planetary gear set. So if you're not familiar, a planetary gear set, it's got the sun gear in the middle, then you've got the planet gears that surround the sun gear, and then you've got a ring gear that sits around all of those. And in traditional, let's say, industrial gearboxes, this is kind of what the motion would look like, right? So you're able to turn uh, the sun gear, or you can lock the ring gear, you can, there's any number of combinations that will, that will induce movement. Now, in the case of an automatic transmission, there are generally three planetary gear, uh, planet gears, I should say, and the planet gears are actually the output. So the input gears are the, uh, the sun gear and the ring gear. And by using the clutch mechanisms, we can either have these rotating or fixed, depending on whether we want um, them to be translating power. Now, the output is actually the planet gears. So they're all connected by spokes um, into an inner shaft. So you can get rotation in this way, right? So that in this instance, the, the, sorry, the, uh, uh, the sun gear is not moving um, and you get rotation from the uh, planet gears. Got to get the nomenclature right there. All right, so what does this require? Well, these planetary gear sets, remember, they can be engaged or disengaged by the clutch mechanism because there's generally uh, two or three of these planetary gear sets in an automatic transmission. So what we need, because there's stop and start motion um, as the gears are engaged and disengaged, so we need extreme pressure performance, right? Because there's some shock loading in the system. So we probably need some kind of EP uh, gear oil additive. In general, we also need anti-wear because, you know, with the gear surfaces, there is sliding motion. And so we're likely to be in the, the mixed um, uh, mixed lubrication regime. Finally, we need it to develop a, a hydrodynamic film. So we want a viscosity which is really tailored towards these gear, gear applications. All right, so if I had to put them all together, what we've listed is we need a fluid that has basically the properties of both a gear oil and a hydraulic oil, right? So we need something with extreme pressure, anti-wear, and develops a hydrodynamic film, right? We need these for the gear sets, but we also need something with high hydraulic efficiency, low deposit formation, keep clean performance, a high VI, and low traction properties. And that is really more about it acting like a hydraulic oil in the torque converter and in the mechatronic section. So it's pretty challenging for formulators to meet all of these needs. Um, and um, yeah, so I mean, really hats off to them for being able to do it. And in some cases have automatic gearboxes, which are virtually fill for life. All right, so I hope that's been a decent introduction to uh, automatic transmission fluids and what they do. As usual, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them in the section below. As usual, this has been Lubrication Explained.